King David, one of the most popular characters in the Bible and in Western culture. But many scholars doubted David ever existed, at least as described in the Bible. Why? Primarily because there was zero evidence of any palace in Jerusalem or for any so-called kingdom of David. Well, those opinions began to change a few years ago because of what was discovered right here. I'm at the city of David, just south of the old city of Jerusalem. And we're going to explore this fascinating spot today on the trail of King David. To learn about the amazing discovery of the long-lost city of David, I met with our friend, archaeologist Danny Herman, outside the ancient Jaffa Gate of Jerusalem. Danny told me that for many centuries, this spot is where everyone thought David had lived and ruled. The official name of this place is David's Citadel, okay. a name given to this area by the Crusaders. And in the 20th century, when they started developing fancy hotels outside the city, the most reputed hotel in Israel facing it is called King David Hotel. Its competition is called David Citadel Hotel. The street behind it is called King David Street. And guess what? They apparently all got it wrong because now we have more archaeological scientific evidence. We now know that the city of David, David's Jerusalem, is on the other side of this hill. And guess what? To this day, there's an ongoing excavation on an almost daily basis making great discoveries. You got to see this. Let's check it out. Let me show you. Danny led me through the old city of Jerusalem, past the Temple Mount, to the other side of town to an archaeological site now open to the public called the City of David. It's a peninsula of land that juts out just south of the rectangular Temple Mount, shaped almost like the state of Florida. Because this was outside the medieval walls of Jerusalem, for centuries no one paid much attention to it. But now we know this area, and not the walled city to the north, was the true location of ancient Jerusalem. This is now uh, a nice view of the eastern slope of the, the city of David, or what's called in Arabic, the village of Silwan. Up to the 19th century, believe it or not, this was an open field where local Arabs were growing onions and cauliflowers. But figures like Charles Warren, a British archeologist, started poking around here, and he uncovered subterranean sections, like down there, to this day, some part of it is named Warren Shaft in his honor. Danny took me down into some of the very chambers that Charles Warren explored, and he reminded me this place was in enemy hands when David and his men first arrived here. Then Danny and I went to one of the most recent excavations here, the pinnacle of the hill, where Dr. Eilat Mazar dug down to bedrock in her search for David's palace. I want to make it clear, we don't have a doormat saying, welcome to my palace, King David, I wish. But the circumstantial evidence, the proto aeolic capital, some of the pottery, the shape of the architecture, all of this seem to suggest, at least this is what Elat Mozart believes, this is it, René. This could be the corner of the complex of David's palace. And it's here, at his palace, that the next episode in David's life takes place. Once David finally gets into his palace here, he tells Nathan the prophet, I'm going to build a temple for the Lord and for the ark to reside in. Nathan goes, great idea. But that night, Nathan receives a message from God. To his surprise, God says no to David's dream of building God a temple. In fact, it sounds almost funny. God says, tell David this, are you the one to build me a house? Did I ever say I wanted a house? All those years of moving around in the tabernacle, did I ever once seem unhappy? He says, I don't need David to build me a house. Instead, tell David this. And he reminds David of his grace toward him. He says, I took you from the pasture, 
from tending the flock and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you've gone, and now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. The Lord himself will establish a house for you, a dynasty. I mean, talk about the grace of God. David starts the day saying, God, I want to build you a house up there on that hill. And God says to David, thanks, but no thanks. But I'll tell you what, David, I'll build you a house, a lineage, a royal dynasty that will go on forever and ever. And of course, that came true when a descendant of David named Jesus entered history and he shall reign forever and ever. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What I want to look at today is when God says no, how do you deal with it? Well, how did David deal with it? Certainly there was nothing wrong with David's dream, but sometimes God just says no, even to good things, because he sees further than we ever could. Now, this is a very personal subject for me. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I ever preached on this passage. My wife, Lori, and I were trying to have a baby. And even despite medical intervention, it just wasn't happening. And I gotta be honest with you, there were a lot of tears. There was a lot of frustration in those days for us. But finally, Lori and I just held hands and prayed together out loud. God, we don't like this, but for whatever reason, at least for the time being, you are saying no to this dream of ours. And as I said, I was actually studying this passage to preach on it in that week. And both of us derived a lot of strength in that moment in our lives from David's response. And I think you're going to derive a lot of strength from this too, because sooner or later, God will say no to one of your dreams. So look at what David does. First, refocus on God's grace. I say that a lot, but it is a biblical principle. David says, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Hey, all I have, I have from God. What more can I say to you? You know what your servants really like, sovereign Lord. In other words, he's saying, I can't complain. I already have so much. I'm already so richly blessed. If I never got another thing from you, God, I already have more than I deserve. And then he goes on and he thinks about God's past rich blessings to him. And that's point two. You know, sometimes when God says no, all I can think about is what I didn't get, how my life isn't exactly the way I want it to be. And that's when very deliberately, very consciously, I need to refocus and redirect my thoughts to God's goodness. Look at these verses. David thinks of the great things that God's already done for him. And as if this were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. He's remembering all of God's good gifts. And then number three, reaffirm my trust in God's goodness. Reaffirm my trust that God is good, even when God says no. And this really means two things. First. Thank God for his veto power. Thank God for his veto power. You know, one of God's best gifts to you can be no. Aren't you glad that God hasn't answered all of your prayers that you've ever prayed in your life the way you wanted him to? This is really where David's going when he says this. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There's no one like you and there is no God but you. God is sovereign and there is no one like God. In other words, God not. He rules, I don't. You know the key to thanking God for his veto power? See no 
as redirection, not rejection. See no as redirection, not rejection. Believe that God is using even this no for his purposes, purposes that maybe you'll never see. Can you believe that? That even though the prayer you are praying isn't getting answered the way you want it to be answered, you can still have a great life, a life of impact, a life of significance, a life filled with blessings. Don't be so focused on the the blessing you want that you're missing the blessing God is giving you. I mentioned that the first time I ever taught on this passage was when Lori and I were struggling with infertility. Well, when I preached that sermon, I called it, When God Says No, and I got into the pulpit and I told the church that week, God is saying no to our dream of having a child. And I related to them very personally, our struggles with infertility. And I said, we're struggling, but we're learning to accept that sometimes for reasons known only to him, God says no. Well, just a few days after that sermon, we found out we were expecting a baby. Our first child, our first son, Jonathan. And I got up in church the next weekend and I paused and I looked at the congregation and I smiled and I said, well, God said yes. And the whole place stood up and erupted in just spontaneous applause. And then somebody in the congregation started singing, great is thy faithfulness. And it spread and pretty soon everybody in the church was just a cappella singing, great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my father. It was spine tingling. It was a moment I will never forget. Why did God put us through that? Why did God have us live through all that time of no before he finally said yes? Well, I may never know, but I'll tell you something. I wouldn't trade that moment for anything. It's a treasured memory. Plus, honestly, Lori and I grew so much in maturity. We grew so close to one another. We grew in our prayer life, in our spiritual life, in ways that maybe we never would have at that stage in our lives if God hadn't said no for a while. And I also know this, when God says no to you, and there are times he will, even to a good dream, for reasons only he may ever know, in those moments, you are walking step by step right on the trail of King David.